let's um, take some questions, hopefully from the floor. It's been really interesting to hear some advice. Uh, let's start at the back here, yes. Um, can I just ask, you've got a, a policy of 30, 60 and 90 days, for communication with your team members. Mm. Do you encourage or expand that to managers for um, people who go away to university? So they encourage, so somebody who's, let's say, seasonal seasonal staff member, mm -hmm. gone away to university and you were saying how it's really important that, you know, hopefully that they come back because you've already spent that investment. Are your managers yeah. encouraged to communicate with them while they're away to kind of make yeah, sure they absolutely. back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that, do you use the same 30, 60, 90 days? No, it, be, it becomes a little bit more, um, it becomes a little bit looser than that. And personally, actually, the, I, the 30, 60, 90 days, don't get too caught up in that because I think we're going to change it and it, maybe it's, you know, is it too much, is it not? I think it's, it's down to your business. But I think the crucial bit of it is, is it's how the conversation takes place. So it's not, I'm, I'm working next to you in the kitchen and I say, oh, you know, so how are you getting on? And you say, I'm doing great. And I say, oh, it must be about 30 days. And you say, yeah, it's great. Cool, we'll catch up in 30. <laughs> Mind it's your not fingers. about that. You know, but that actually happens loads. You know, and, th and then you say to the head chef, oh, have you caught up with them? Oh, yeah, yeah, we had a chat yesterday. Oh, right, okay. But did you understand that last week something was wrong at home? And did you understand that he got a flat tire last week on the way home? And actually his shoes really hurt. And, um, and, you know, and he's got a dish that he wants to put on the menu. Do we really understand those people? And, the, and with the part-timers, it would be that someone senior in that team is having a conversation with them, knows exactly where they're going to university, what they're studying, when they're coming back. They're all, you know, again, we didn't talk too much about it, but this whole generation thing, they're all communicating on their phone the whole time now. So they're all on a WhatsApp group. They're all on a text, I don't know what they're on, but um, you know, they're very much, and what they do is they get into them before they're coming back. So if you know you're recruiting in December, or you need people in December, you're already on them in October, November saying, I've got this for you, got shifts for you, all this kind of stuff. So yeah, absolutely, we'd keep that relationship going. And the places that, the managers that are really good at it, have a better staffing situation. What would, you, what would you do if somebody texted you and said, I'd love a job at the pigs, um, here's my bullet point career, would you take that as seriously as somebody I'd that you know they they no, I'd say if they sent me a bullet point career on a, on a text message, they weren't on the correct platform. Now I understand it all. Um, <laughs> You'd I mean, they'd be the wrong set. generation. They'd be you texting me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, we, we brought it up because it's about how we, how we need to adapt to the market now, not how, how we perceive the market and how it should be, you know. Uh, definitely, definitely. In, last, in the last three months, the hotel director, one of the hotels, said, oh, I turned them down because the cover letter was rubbish. And I was like, what? These kids, like, they don't even know what cover letter is. Like, I just don't <laughs> understand it. You know, they didn't say they wanted to work in hospitality. Well, get over yourself. So, you know, we had, there were 70 of us in the audience and we had a whiteboard and we had to put a cross on one side and a tick on the other. And every time we asked a question, we had to, you know, um, hold them up. And so the recruitment point person put something, you know, do, do you need an off letter? Everyone put crosses and ticks and so on. And it got down to, if someone applies to you over WhatsApp, is that, is that okay? Well, yeah. Yeah. I've got someone applying. Let's, let's, <laughs> I'll let's, take it. Yeah. <laughs> Does someone actually take them? But you're crazy if you haven't had a conversation with those people. You know, we're trying to commit to having a phone conversation with every single person that applies to us. And I know that might not sound a huge amount, but for some of us it is. You, know, you, can, you can have a, a, a position out there and have 20 or 30 um, uh, applications, and it's important you do speak to each one, because if we only talk about, if we talk about personality over skills, then how are you going to know unless you had a conversation with them? So this is also about being adaptable and massively changing your traditional policies and the hospitality industry traditional policies. Yeah. You've just got to be so flexible to be more productive. Yeah. But what's crazy, what's really crazy, is that in however long we've been rabbiting on about it, we've not really talked about hospitality. We've talked about productivity and we've talked about all this kind of stuff. It, we are in the hospitality industry and we're crazy if we think there's anything else but that. You know, we can all big ourselves up to be this amazing companies and all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about finding someone that's hospitable. <laughs> it's, you know, and that's what it's about. And unless you speak, how can you tell if someone's hospitable from a cover letter or a WhatsApp application? Yeah. You know, it's about making sure that we really, we really understand these people, that they really understand what we're about. And if we can't even be bothered to phone them, how inhospitable is that? We're phoning from hospitality business and we haven't even called them. Sorry, is that yeah. another five minutes? Is that another score? Yeah, no, no. Right. You got a question from the back. Yeah. Um, Tom, you were talking about um, recruitment, retention, being kind to people, looking after people. When you go in somebody else's hotel, can you, do you get an immediate sense of how those people are treated? Who work there, people who work there? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, 
not necessarily in terms of... Be careful of, what you say, because yeah, Will's, yeah, 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 Will's yeah, in the yeah. audience here <laughs> from Watergate Sorry, Bay. So. Right there. <laughs> right. Um, um, no, I don't think it's necessarily the way they're treated, but it's the environment they're, they're in. So here, I was here all afternoon. The guys are comfortable, they're polite, they do the job, you know, the, the tables are cleared and the orders are taken, and it's all absolutely as it should be. I think where you... Sometimes what you spot is a lack of, a lack of management, either through what they are doing, are they carrying out their job correctly? I mean, I, do you know what I have to say, actually? In answer to your question, it's probably best that I say I don't really... I try not to observe, because otherwise I get told off. I get told by my well, wife to face the wall and not look around. <laughs> and, <laughs> you're like, working all the time. Look at the light bulbs and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Snagging all the time, yeah. working all but the I think, time. But I think, you, I think you can. But more importantly, you know, I, I think if you as an employer can't tell, then there's a problem. And is that about being visible? Visibility of... Of the owner, of the senior management? Um, well, or is it better to, to be stuck behind a the... desk? Does it make any difference whether you're visible I think if you're or walking not, I around? Think, I think it's about how you manage your time. If you're not on the front lines at the appropriate time with your team, then there's a problem. Yeah. Because they're, they're the ones that are dealing with it. And that might be good or bad stuff. So, um, you know, I think it's really important you stand face to face with them. And equally, when it's not going right, you stand in front of them. You know, there's too many managers out there that are like, oh, yeah, just tell that guest that, yeah. sorry, the water didn't work last night, but tough. Yeah. You know, you've got to be out there facing up to it because it's horrible. Yeah. You know, it's, it's brutal and we expect 22-year-olds that, that are supposed to be hospitable to stand up to someone who's really not having a good time. Um, at the same time, I think it's really, really important for managers to stand back and let their team show them what they can do. You know, the, the, the people need to be given the freedom to express themselves and to, you know, I, I'd never... That's it, that's, I'd never... Strong, strong sentence, isn't it? Um, we would never... Um, tell someone off for making a mistake. So if, a, if someone said to me, the guest came down, there was no management around, and they had a horrible night's day, I comped the whole room, I'd say, fine. It, it might not have been the right thing to do, and next time, maybe it's this, or maybe it's that. If they do it a second time, then you say, okay, well, why didn't you listen last time? And the third time, then there might be a strong word. But at the, f the point is, is that that person has been hospitable and empathetic, and we need to kind of ensure that that happens. And that empowerment is really important to you. Because with some hotel, Groups, big groups, actually, that say you're not allowed to say no to a customer, ever. I've heard that. So the answer is yes. Now, what is the question? <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> it's about. I mean, we would say it's about saying there are times when you say no, but you offer an alternative. Yeah. Be constructive. You know, it was, was, I mean, it's, I hate something where you can't really answer the question. So you know, uh, can I skydive off of the building? No. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, it's, uh, so. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question. Sound bites, aren't they? Uh, yeah, just here. Uh, I think there's a microphone coming around. Just, just interested, as you, <coughs> you said at the beginning about collection of data. Um, do you provide? Don't a ask me too many questions. I'm not very good at data. <laughs> do you, or do tech you provide a platform for your team members in your business to? give you genuine feedback, no. whether that's good, bad, or ugly. Because I, I don't know whether or not we all need to be braver in terms of really listening to our team members' feedback if we want to get better. hundred percent. You're absolutely right. And we, uh, we started, and we sort of did it piecemeal in each hotel. Um, and now we've... we've com uh, so at the end of our meeting, we put... So we, we ensured that all the staff in that room understood that it was actually their responsibility to make sure that each individual staff member had a great experience. But as a company, we needed to obviously come up with some commitments as well. It's not just about saying, thanks very much, get on with it, we're off. So one of our commitments was to ensure that there was a forum where um, all staff could come together in each hotel and have an open conversation, those would get fed back. And it's just, you know, we're working through it at the moment to work out who's the best person to host it and all of that kind of stuff. But also that Robin would be, or myself, would be in each hotel for an, I mean, I'm in the hotels every day, but for a, a formal kind of six-month, let's get everything out on the table. Because I think it's also really important that the staff understand there are boundaries. You know, they can't all have a Porsche to drive to work in. That's, that's kind of how it's not going to happen. But, you know, but at the same time, they need to, they need to have that expression. And, yeah, yes, you're absolutely right. It, it needs to happen more, yeah. But at the same time, I think we're quite good at it at the same time because we have a very open-door policy. Okay, next question. Will, give him a, give him a really yeah. hard question. <laughs> no, no, I was just interested in, in technology, actually, and, and productivity. Um, you know, we're all in a, um, 
in a kind of boutique space and we don't want technology to, to rule the roost. But, mm. you know, where do you use technology sort of effectively in productivity terms? No, we're, really, we're not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're starting to become more effective at it. Um, uh, so um, we introduced quite a lot of technology into our central reservations team recently. Um, because we were not being effective at that in terms of our staffing of it, in terms of um, how many staff we had, in terms of how we took the calls. We were dropping up to 40% of calls sometimes. Um, uh, we use technology in terms of, I mean, it's not really people related, but in terms of our F&B system, so we're reporting off that. But we've now moved to a new people system, which is able to give us, I mean, I think the problem is as you grow, you know, you'll know this, you start to, you, you, you have a template that you work from, that you've just kind of worked from. And when it was one hotel, it was a sort of Excel spreadsheet that you used to kind of do stuff on. And then, but when it's five, and then that was given to someone else to put into some sort of computer system. And, but as you expand, suddenly that becomes very difficult. So um, our old system wouldn't allow us to put in a rotor and be able to forecast staffing for it because, it, I don't know, something like the shift patterns didn't work or something. So we have spent tens of thousands of pounds on a new system, sure that we can do that. So in terms of people, that becomes a little bit better because we're able to understand the ebbs and flows of the business a bit more, um, which would help us with rotoring and things like that. Um, there's probably other stuff, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> from, a, from a guest point of view, IT is a bit of a nightmare, isn't it? Because actually, for example, the, the common issue that's always talked about is lighting and how many buttons you have to press before you go to bed at night to yeah. turn all the lights off in the room. And actually, the best hotels are those where you just press one button by the bed and everything goes off. Yes. I mean, guests don't want more IT, do they? They want less. Um, again, I'm not probably the best person to ask because Robin hates a light switch that he can't work. So we have ones by the bed that turn off the bedside lights and we have one by the room that turns off the back one there. Um, whereas if you go to Limewoods, they have, you know, dim the room, half dim the room, not dim the room. <laughs> it's like Fill the bath. It's like a disco by the end of it, yeah. Um, uh, but there's a kind of mix. I think some people like to get away from it. Um, and also, I think you choose the hotel that you go to. So if you're at a hotel in central London and you're on a business meeting, then you probably want it to be quite businessy. But I think, you know, we occasionally get people that come and want to do some work at the pigs, but um, it's, it's much more likely that they're just going to sit down and have a drink in the bar. Yeah. Okay, next question. I'm sort of drifting from people a little bit, but anyway, mm. that's fine. Is there another one? Okay. Yeah. I'm currently just asking, you're discussing rotors before, and like saying, do you currently do a two month rotor now at the moment? Or? So, um, it's really interesting. You're a chef, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Um, <laughs> no, Small world. No, we met earlier. It's not that I can tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so at Limewood, so Luke Holders, the head chef of Limewood, works okay. with um, Angela Hartner very closely. She's um, uh, the name chef there as well. And they went to a three month rotor. All right, yeah. And um, so I find I'll put one up like four days in advance and it'll change five or six times within the next two days. So yeah. I was thinking if you put that much in advance, it might be very difficult because everyone wants something different. They do, but what people, that's because they're used to the way your rotor works. Mm -hmm. If actually you say to someone, you know, in four weeks' time, that you've got um, a weekend off there, you've got four days. In what people don't like is to work five days straight and then know two days before that actually they've got another five days because you're saying to them, it's great, you can have a weekend off. And, and that's the difficulty. It's a sort of mental preparation. And also what you'll find it does is it, re it reduces, it aids retention because people have a buy-in. They have a buy-in to seeing that this is what they're doing in three months' time. If they don't get the rotor the next week, they don't care. Yeah. They've got no buy-in at all. And it is really hard, don't get me wrong. I'm yeah. not saying, you know, Luke's found it quite difficult. But the other things that you're able to do is you're able to, staff are able to see when they're going to be short-staffed, mm -hmm. uh, when you're, they're going to be, you're going to be short-staffed and they're going to be working extra hours. And they can kind of mentally prepare themselves for it. And then on the road to the next week, you say, new guy starting here. Yeah. And then this person's leaving here. And then I can put your holiday in here. And actually, it does work. It is difficult. Yeah. But we then move that to the, the pigs. And all the chefs were different. So some embraced it straight away, and some were like, no, I can't do it. I can only do it a week in advance on a Sunday night. And, and slowly they're getting to it. And we've tried different things. We've tried four days on, three days off. You know, lots of people talk about that. It's your advantage because you already know what they're going to be doing for the next month because you've put them down. But if they don't change that next week. But, yeah. Well, they shouldn't be changing. You know, yeah. you well, say yeah. if you want to change something, that's fine. Change it with someone else yeah. with your kind of opinion. I'd, 
One more question, yeah. quick one, was about CVs, because when you said about the CVs, about looking for the right uh, candidate for the yeah. role. Chef's slightly different. Okay, cool. That's yeah. the answer then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, dad, my dad's a chef, so I can always say that's a chef thing. They're slightly different. I wasn't, um, wasn't going to do a Donald Trump there and say yeah. no more questions. Yeah, uh, yeah. You're really horrible. You're a really nice person. Your business should be proud of you. You're fantastic. Thank you very much. The, the only thing I would say, just to, to, to slightly counter, yeah, you're absolutely right. And a lot of these things, you know, the, um, the kitchen is always a slightly different thing. But um, the CV thing is important. But how many CVs have you read where the guys come in or the girl? Uh, interestingly, our chefs, our kitchens are now nearly fifty percent female, and it's and it's created. Uh, it's, it's created. Mm? Very good. Well, it's not. It's not on purpose, actually. No. It's not. Um, you know, it's not. That'd be discrimination. But it wouldn't be have very been, careful. Don't leave me down but, that route. But five, really. five years ago, yeah. you wouldn't have said that. Oh, it's a completely different environment. You know, and we had a, actually one of the nicest stories we had. We had a girl come down from Scotland. She said, "I wanted to come and work in a sort of place that was um, uh, cared about where its food f was from and was doing local stuff." And she looked at all our Instagram pages, and she chose us because of the number of girls you saw working in the kitchen. Mm. And it does create a different environment. But what I was going to say was, what was your question? Uh, well, I think <laughs> the, you might be able to say, I've had some members of staff who come in their CV hasn't been. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. That's, that's probably one in ten. Yeah, that but... actually made it through and been really good without having that, that backup of a CV that says then they're used to the industry. <laughs> I've had lots of people come in and yeah. they really want to do it, they really want to cook, and two days later, they think, I don't want to, this is not what I want. Yeah. But even though trying to make them really enjoy the role, but it's just... Yeah, I mean, I, the chef's thing is slightly different because, one, they all apply through an agency, so they've all got a CV anyway. Two, the, the agencies always embellish their CVs. Three, everyone, by nature of who we are, we always talk, say we can do more than we can. Um, and uh, I think quite often the expectation is different to what the reality is within the kitchen. Um, and the problem with kitchens now is that people can go and, you know, chefs can go and work anywhere for nine to five now for 20 quid an hour, and it's, and it's really difficult. So you've got to be making sure that that there's lots of opportunity. And again, we're lucky in a sense that, you know, we might say, okay, you're a bit bored after six months. Do you want to go and work with Angela in London for a bit? You, you know, we try and make sure that we, uh, as far as possible, we try not to be scared about letting people go for a bit. Sometimes it backfires and they don't come back. <laughs> um, but hopefully they will come back in the future. And, um, you know, if it means going and doing a stage at somewhere or um, working with a different chef for a bit or working at another kitchen within ours, then we, we try and do that. But yeah, it's... Um, Kitchen's a tough one, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, the question just there. Yeah, hi. Just taking forward the, uh, the whole sort of appraising attitude, personality, and all the rest. Um, kind of, how, how can we make this process as least dismissive, open, but equally time effective? I mean, do you, first of all, do you really telephone interview everybody who applies? That's, that's exactly what we don't do at the moment. That is what we would like to get to doing, yeah. Okay, so yeah. at the moment, how do you recruit by attitude and being hospitable as opposed to then a good, then a good, then got the right experience? But, but I think that's exactly the point. We're in that transition point at the moment. Okay. Where we've said, you know what, we need to open ourselves up. So it's up. a goal at the moment, this it's an objective. This is a goal, but it's also about... You, you, uh, if you are asking people to do that, you have to train them to do it first. So that's our kind of first stage of saying to all of our senior team, right, this is where we want to go to. We want to make sure that we're telephone screening everyone. And so another, um, this is another sort of one of those, oh, wow, eureka moments that someone just puts forward. So if you're lucky enough to have a load of um, applications for a position, and they, so I think in one reception team, we had 30 applications for a position. And what happens is that someone sits down, they're like, I've got half an hour, I'll whiz through those and see what's that. And they oh, no experience, no experience. Oh, they don't have Opera, which is our room map, um, uh, booking system. Don't have that. Oh, that person is quite good. That person. So we'll call three in for interview. And what we miss, because it's departmentalised, is we miss the fact that actually that person had a bit of bar experience. Oh, you know what? We were looking for a bar person there. And so the recruitment person said, well, why, why do we do this thing? This is really time-consuming. Why don't you just say to everyone, we've got, okay, there's been a load of applications. You're invited to an, to, um, an open day at the village hall. We'll interview, we'll take all the hotel direct, um, all the managers down there, and we'll interview 30 of you in one go. And you might go through 27 of them and say, okay, they're not suitable. But you might pick up your receptionist there, a bar person, and a housekeeper. And we're all suddenly like, oh, my God. How brilliant is that? <laughs> so there's these kind of little bits and pieces that have really sort of worked for us. Or another one was um, to advertise that we always have on a third Thursday of every month, whatever it is, that there's just a drop into the hotel. Just come along and see us. And it might be that we get a speculative 
drop in that becomes a manager. It might be that we get no one. But I think by opening as many different avenues as possible, uh, you, you have the greatest chance of success. Um, in terms of how you recruit for you know, attitude, as you were saying, in, in that, you know, it's, I think it comes down to someone really understanding your business being a great manager, you know, I'm talking about the person interviewing, <laughs> you know, they've got to really understand what they're, you know, what the culture of this is, what they're looking for. Um, sometimes you see people in our industry and you think, what, and why have you chosen this industry? Um, and often, often if, they're back of, if they're back of house, make sure they go through three interviews minimum, because that way different people in your own business will buy into them. And I think too many businesses don't do that when they hire. They'll do one, maybe two interviews, and then think, great, I need them urgently. And then, actually, you miss that third interview, which will root out the best people versus the not-so-good ones. Yeah, question just there. There's a microphone coming your way. Do you recruit as a group, or, is it, or do you work as independents in a group? In so, a it, it, generally independents within the group, because you're rec recruiting for a specific position. But we do also have a, um, a, a box that says, if you'd like to let's, let us have your CV, then send it in, and we hold that in a pool. That we'll... Have you found that it's... I've found that branching into different hotels is actually the net's bigger, so potentially, it's an, as long as we talk to each other, it's an easier... Um, it's easier to get good staff to go throughout the, the area of the hotels rather than if you're just an independent. And often you're, you're quite a niche... Um, I don't know what you think about that. Do, do you mean so someone's applying into a central for, um, area and we can say, do you want to go there, there, there? Well, food and beverage, for instance, if you're, in, if you're independent, often your, your, your needs are very dynamic to a certain role. Mm -hmm. where, whereas, you know, I'm finding that I'm using probably a more mature um, workforce, but mm -hmm. I'm using them in bite-sized bits. Yes. Um, so, so my sort of thought process, rather than trying to fill one hole, um, I've got lots of people filling lots of holes. Yeah, I think that's the way that the industry goes. I mean, this, it's the kind of gig economy stuff, isn't it? That people have multiple jobs and they've got, you know, the classic one that we always talk about is, you know, a, a mother who's dropped children at school. You know, you know, traditionally, be like, oh no, it doesn't fit our shift pattern to have someone from ten till three. But you know what? If you had someone from ten till three, it was really, really good. You take them every time, and yet. Historically, we've always said, no, no, that's not how we do it in the hospitality industry. So, yeah, we're having to change our mind and we're having to adapt. And I think those that don't adapt will find it really hard. Find it really hard. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. Any others? Before I really put you on the spot. Oh, right. I thought that was the end. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No? Okay, so quick this fire round. This is the one you haven't... Quick <laughs> fire round, I haven't <laughs> asked you yet. So, um, what's the one thing you do to recognise excellence? Talk to people. Just say you did really well. As important or? as anything. Okay. All right. Um, we do loads of stuff. You know, there's the like, there's the employee of the month, and there's the bottle of champagne here, and there's this, and there's that, and there's you know, there's loads of stuff. But ultimately, it's about recognition, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You know, there's nothing worse. Do you know what's there's nothing worse than a head of department saying, "Oh, the hotel director told me to give you this." Like, how, like you know, we're only hundred people. Spend the time to give it to me yourself. Yeah. You know, I think. Yeah, and they appreciate it more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what's the one thing a hospitality firm should do and focus on Talking to, to ensure people. success? Talking to people again. Yeah. Genuinely, I think it's really like you know. I think they're. I think you you ignore your staff at your peril, and and how can you understand what they're enjoying, what they're not enjoying? You know, you might think what you're giving them is is the bee's knees, and you can't work out why they're leaving every month. Yeah. And you think, I just don't, just don't get it. We do this for them, we do that for them. And then you talk to them and say, we don't want this and that. We want yeah. this and that. And do you, do you actually find that people want more of those conversations as team everyone members? Wants, everyone wants They just want constant feedback, constant no, no, appraisals as such? No, no. It's about... Under, so I had, so I had uh, uh, a housekeeping manager and I started in this new business in Oxford. In, uh, it wasn't a new business, but I was new there. And I said, right, we're gonna do, I'm going to do all these appraisals with you. And she said, I don't want an appraisal. I said, right, I'm going to do it with you. She said, okay. We sat there and I asked her the questions and she was really, and she said, you know, I just really don't want to do this. Tell me I'm doing a great job, that's fine. But I'm too old for all this. And that's fine. Why am I going to put her through that again? So some, the person that wants loads of recognition, give them the recognition they need and tell them to stop when they're becoming too much yeah. and guide them and teach them and tell them that it's not all about that and, to get, and set them goals. And people, yeah, people need to be talked to. 
And then what's the one thing you would have advised yourself at 18 when you really came into the industry to do Talk differently? To <laughs> probably would, actually. Be getting that message. Yeah. No, I probably would. I probably would. I think, um, I don't know, it's slightly different when you're 18 and you're just coming into the industry, isn't it? Because it, then, it, for, for me, I was lucky enough that it was just great fun. I was up in London, aged 18, just killing it. I loved it, you know. It's, yeah. um, it, it, was a, it, it was a really good, fun time. I think um, the one bit of advice that I give to youngsters now is whatever you do, work in, work in the best possible place you can work. Because... If you're working at a really ordinary place where the, the management, the owners, your leaders, whoever they are, don't give two hoots about you and the product is actually a bit rubbish and you're not really learning anything, you're just making a bit of cash, then you're wasting your time. Yeah. You're much better to work somewhere where, you know, I'd walk out of nights at the French Laundry absolutely enraged. You know, it's really intense. You've got Thomas Keller standing right in front of you and you're exploiting the tables to him and it's super intense. But it was the best place I could have possibly, possibly worked. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's crucial. Never, ever waste your time. And if you get to, if you get to a place and, and, and it's rubbish, leave. It's not, it's not, it's, it's there for if you haven't got it right. Yeah. So. Good advice. Well, Tom, thank you very much. Thank really you. interesting tips. Um, we're going to take a break there before we carry on. Thank you very much, Thomas. Yeah.